platforms or digital that have a key strength of acquiring customers like you know we have covered search, adwords etc. I think search has a very good strength in customer acquisition because what happens is a person searches something so you know the intent of the person and then you can show him an ad based on that intent right. So any time you want to acquire a customer search has inherent strength over the other platforms of digital. If you take brand building, digital can actually now become a very effective brand building tool. So in fact, I'm going to cover this more in depth uh, at one of the presentations later. But the approach of brand building or digital is radically different than the way we approach conventional media. The fundamental differences are that it's an auction medium, it requires content, and brand building in digital is done through content consumption rather than content interruption. So we are used to, as traditional marketeers, interrupting somebody's content and showing him an ad. Digital, that doesn't work. So in digital, what you do is you have to con create content where the consumer is going to consume. And while he's consuming the content, that's the time when you communicate your brand message. So it's content sort of brand building through content consumption. Similarly, if you take information dissemination, right, there are a lot of free platforms, whether it's Google Hangout, whether it's Twitter, whether it's YouTube, you can actually now disseminate information across your target audiences. It could be prospective customers, it could be distributors, dealers, independent financial advisors, anybody you want to actually educate about a certain concept, there are a lot of these platforms available which can disseminate information for you very, very inexpensively or almost free. So the thing is that, the key is that always have a business objective in mind and then map the relevant digital platform to that business objective rather than have a digital ma uh, platform first mapped out and then trying to map out a digital business objective to it. So I have had a lot of customers who come and tell us that I want to acquire customers through Twitter. Now that's an oxymoron, right? You're starting off that why do you need me? Because you already decided what you want to use it for. My thing is that I have a goal. I want to acquire customers. And now there are different platforms that have inherent strength over the other platforms. The platform that maps perfectly to it, that's the platform that it should be used. Right? And that's the very critical thing when you're planning a digital strategy. Have a business objective clear. Don't have a digital objective. Don't have, I want to get fans, I want to get followers, I want to get this. What is it that you want to achieve from a business objective point of view? And then the relevant business platform, or the digital platform can be mapped across to it. Then there's community building. So I would say that if you take, just take the whole social media, I think the strength of social media is actually engagement. The strength of social media is sort of uh, cross-selling and upselling. Because what happens is it allows you to engage with a certain set of audiences, it could be existing customers of yours, and then map them and engage with them so that you can cross-sell to them, cross-sell to their friends, get referrals, but also sell more products to them and upgrade them. If you use social media, uh, the non-paid part of social media for customer acquisition, you're not going to be very successful because they are not coming to social media platforms to sort of see ads. They're coming there to engage with their friends, family, whoever they are, right? So it's very important to have a business objective that, okay, if your digital strategy involves crossing and upselling, then social media platforms can plug into that very, very effectively. That's the strength of a social media platform. Right? Uh, you figure online evolution management or consumer insights. Now, think of it like this, that whenever we type something in Google, that's what we are thinking at that moment of time. Right? So if you total up all the searches that are happening all over the world, I would say that Google is the closest man has ever come to creating a mind reading machine. There are so many minds are being read every single minute, every single hour, every single day across the world. Right? So you can also say it's a database of intentions and now tools like Google AdWords, keyword traffic estimator, etc., tells you what people are thinking because number of searches for each keyword is listed out there across the country, across the city of the world, right? So now just imagine you know what the world is thinking. To a certain extent, social media listening is like it's a database of actions because most of the times when we share something on social media, it's some things that we have done or about to do is 90% is of the post, right? So now think of it like this. If you know what the world is thinking and you know what the world is doing, can it help you across your organization to plan products, to do consumer surveys, understand how consumers are thinking, how the thinking is evolving? All these things can be sort of used across the organization. From marketing research point of view, from planning advertising campaigns, product development, everything. So the key is that if you want to understand consumer trends, social media listening and Google search sort of the adverse interface can give you these insights. So it's very important that if you want to actually have a business objective in mind, and these platforms can keep on changing, right? So at the end of the day, the business objectives will not change. We may still, 100 years down the line, we still would like to acquire customers. Out of 
Under the other hand, we still will like to disseminate certain information about our product or service to consumers. So the platforms may change, but the business objective will not change. So if a certain platform gains more strength than what it is today, or one platform out here gets wiped out, the business objective will still remain the same, and you'll know that now this platform has to map to the business objective, right? Then it becomes very simple to map out digital strategy. So you don't have a Facebook strategy, you have a cross-selling upselling strategy. You don't have a YouTube strategy, you have an information dissemination strategy. Then whether it's YouTube or some other platform, it won't be relevant anymore. Uh, what I would like to structure this uh, sort of a masterclass workshop, where you call it, is that focus on the business objective. So whenever somebody even asks a question, try to map it to your business. What is it that you would like to achieve from a business point of view? And then we'll tell you how digital can be leveraged out there. Rather than asking questions, we have questions like, how do I use Twitter for customer acquisition, right? Because those questions, I cannot answer actually, because I don't know. And then I get examples that, okay, Dell sells $20 million of products to Twitter. I say, okay, you know what, you take your company $250 billion in sales, I'll sell $20 million of products of yours to Twitter, right? Because it's still 0.2% of the entire business, right, from Twitter. So strength of Twitter is not customer acquisition. Second thing is, we try to deep dive into some topics. So we'll take one topic, we'll deep dive into it. So we're going to cover about five to six topics through the day, and we deep dive one, one hour into each of these topics. Uh, let's make it interactive. So we would like to people to ask questions. We'll try to cover those questions. I think that's the time when you'll actually learn the most. Because the content that we have out here, you have the presentation with you in the future. You will go through it, but the question answer is the place where you learn the most. So some ground rules on the questions. Uh, I think the question should be something which is relevant to everybody. So you have an analytics code which is not firing in your traffic from Google Analytics and your this is not matching. Please ask me if this question or a cup of coffee outside, I'll answer it to you. But it's not going to be relevant to most of the audiences, right? So if the question is very, very precisely for your business, which per se you have a question, Ben and I are going to be here the whole day. Please catch us in an outside and ask us a question. Please also ask a question that you think the audience can't answer, right? So if you ask me a very basic question, which you know that everybody in the audience will also know, I mean, you ask a question, sometimes we know, right? Lastly, please make sure that the questions are actually questions and not comments, right? I've had questions that go on for five minutes, right, at the end of the day. So just make sure that the question is definitely shorter than the answer you're expecting, right? So basic ground rules, and I think we are off. These are the six topics we're going to cover through the day. Uh, so we're going to focus on organic search. We're going to focus on paid. How do you actually do brand building through digital? Uh, Cross-selling and upselling, which covers the mainly the social media aspect of it. Understanding consumer trends. And also some broad guidelines of how one should think digital. So we've lived in this world which was slightly analog or mainly analog has now moved to a digital world. So how do you actually approach digital overall? Right? There are some fundamental differences and I think it's very important when you start digital to understand these differences. So you know, one of the things that I deal with a lot of CMOs, now the problem is that 30 years they've done conventional media. So let's say one of the things I start off with is the cost of failure in conventional media is very high. Right? They are, if they make one mistake in a television campaign, the CEO, CMO could lose his job. His career could get affected. In digital, you know, one failure is going to make him lose a few lakhs. Right? It's not going to impact. The only way you do digital is through failures because of optimization. You can't have a blueprint of what you want to do. You can have a compass in your hand and you start walking in the right direction. And that's the way to actually execute digital. So the approach of digital there are a lot of different different things that you do on digital. The approach has to be radically different than the way we've approached marketing or any of these things in the past. So I'm going to cover that part of it through about 10 to 12 insights of how one approaches digital. Uh, so before we start off, let me give you a quick uh, one minute background on what are the things we do for different partners. So we've been in the industry 15, 15 years. We mainly work with large enterprises, so seven, eight banks, seven, eight insurance companies, you know, clear trip kind of guys, people who spend a crore and a half, two crores a month on AdWords, uh, SEO projects that they invest about crore rupees a year. That's the kind of level of mainly the partners we work with. What happens is there we've seen is that digital is 20% of it, but integrating digital into the organization and making their organization fit on digital is 80% of it. How do you increase the fitness of the, of the organization itself on digital? I think that is the key for all of you in this room. 
we will not have an opportunity to hire agencies, right? The agencies who are the large agencies. We have to make ourselves aware of what digital is, understand digital and actually start using digital and become ourselves digitally fit. That's the only way we can leverage digital. So the key for us is that so many times we uh, come across SMBs and they say, you know, I'm going to hire a digital guy. That's not going to work for you because for you to hire him, retain him is going to be very, very challenging. Plus what will happen is when he leaves, then your digital strategy leaves along with him. So the key is that all of us in the room who are running our own businesses, unless we learn digital on our own and start implementing it, we will not be able to sustain and grow our businesses. And digital is going to be very, very critical for all of you guys in this room. So if you take 15 years back, you know, we've had pitches where we've gone to a thousand crore company and the person has told us that Vivek, and my pitch used, you need a website. And the guy told me that, you know, Vivek, I'm convinced we need a website. And just before I was about to say yippee, he said, you know what, what I'm not convinced about is the timing. Should I get it now or should I get it after five years? And I was all of 22 years old and I said like, oh my God, if he doesn't make a website, how am I going to do digital marketing? In the last 10, 15 years, that has changed dramatically. Today, the CEOs, CMOs, promoters of companies are very, very active at all level organizations about understanding digital. So as an SMB, we had this competitive edge earlier that big guys were not looking at digital. Now the big guys are looking at digital. So understand we actually you know, invest more time and resources in understanding digital, we will not be able to compete with them effectively because they'll always have more resources than what we have. So the more time you invest in learning digital, the better it is going to be for your organization in the years to come. So Ben, uh, you can take it over, give it a little intro and all yours. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Perfect. All right. Um, yes, so, sorry. Uh, my name's uh, Ben. Um, I come from the UK, obviously. I've been working in digital for the entire of my working life, so the last 11 years. Um, I've worked with many banks globally. I've worked with many travel aggregators, many online shops, any type of digital industry I've been in. I've worked with SMBs, little guys, big guys, the whole, whole gamut. Um, the things that I've been... Uh, Privy to as such, as I started out in the world of search. So I started out buying keywords, buying ads, and doing kind of performance-led sort of media buying. Uh, I then moved into the affiliate world where I started uh, teaming up with other sites owners and kind of buying and selling traffic, a kind of whole idea of arbitrage, where I buy clicks from one guy and I'll sell them to another guy for profit. So and just sit in the middle making money off the back of that. So I did that for quite some time. Then I got into SEO, this, uh, this whole concept of optimization where you can get traffic for free. So I started doing SEO, um, got a whole load of websites ranking for brands, and I was selling brands traffic to brands because my websites used to rank rather than their websites. And uh, so, so I used to make money out of, out of doing that. So I've done a whole lot of different things in my time. Um, but the new thing is obviously social. Started getting into social. We're doing sort of social-led campaigns, which you now, uh, they kind of link into your sort of, uh, the SEO side of things. They're very much intrinsically linked. Um, so really, uh, my job at Communicate2 is, is I'm head of all strategies. So my role is to give brands a digital strategy, tell them how to, how to actually go about doing digital. And it could be something very simple or it could be something very complicated where a lot of different things are having to interconnect and talk to each other to get stuff going. So what I'm going to uh, do today is I'm going to talk you through first the, uh, the fundamentals of your own website. So how do I get my website uh, sort of web ready so that it actually gets found and people come to me organically. Then we're going to talk about how I can pay for people to get to me. Um, then Vivek's going to cover sort of the brand building piece where we kind of how do I, how do, I do a bit of a brand building. Um, and then we're going to look at sort of more community based stuff. So social media, how I utilize social media for upsell, cross sell and how I actually kind of build communities and get them working for me to sell my brand. Uh, and then I'll talk about sort of um, reputation management, how I control my image online. And then Vivek will kind of sum up the whole piece at, at the end. So uh, we'll just cut all this. So we'll start with the SEO side of things. Okay, so um, this will make some sense. So these headers don't really make sense at the moment. But as I go through this presentation, these will kind of start to, to make sense. Now, the reason they'll make sense is I'm going to start with Google. Everyone here obviously knows what Google is. Google is the number one de facto search engine pretty much globally. Um, and it's the number one engine everyone really talks about when it comes to SEO. How do I get myself listed in Google organically so I'll get traffic uh, naturally, okay? So we're going to have a little look at Google. Um, now, fundamentally, 
to do SEO, you've got to really align yourself to what Google is trying to achieve. Uh, Google over there kind of came up and said uh, what, they, what they're trying to do. They're trying to connect people to content, right? They, this is their mission statement, okay? Google's mission is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. Now, their algorithm, the way they approach things, is solely defined by this kind of mantra. They're trying to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful to the people that, who are trying to get hold of this information, okay? Now, when we do SEO, we've actually got to think with that mantra in mind. But this looks rather complicated. This is the original PageRank algorithm written by Larry Page. Um, there was a, a white paper called Backrub that he wrote many years ago in 1998. Um, and since this lovely algorithm got developed, um, thousands of PhDs have been working for the last 14 years to hone, refine, and improve this algorithm and make it what it is today. Okay? Now, there's 500 plus updates a year to the algorithm. Um, now, you've got to ask yourself, do you think you have the intelligence to crack this algorithm so you can come number one? My short answer to that is no. We simply do not have that intelligence, okay? So, we're going to go back to the fundamentals of what Google's trying to do. They're trying to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. So, how do we actually go about kind of approaching this is maybe looking at it from more of a philosophical sort of viewpoint rather than trying to break this algorithm. But it's important that we know what the original system did so that we can get a kind of idea what the basics are that I need to do to my website as such. So, this is the original, again, the original background. But basically what Google does is it crawls content. It registers a doc ID, ID uh, which will be a URL, a specific URL, that takes that back to an index. It then crawls that URL and looks for the words within the URLs. And every word it finds, it gives a word ID to that word. It then counts the number of hits that word appears on the page. So if a word appears 10 times, it gets 10 hits. Okay? It then weights it. And different words in different sort of uh, shapes and sizes and different sort of places on the site will have different sort of weightages depending on what the word is. So a large piece of text will generally be denoted as the title. And if the word's in the title, then it'll be given more weight as opposed to the word being in context. Okay? So it counts up the hits and it scores the pages for these hits. It then has a page rank mechanism, which was that algorithm we saw before, uh, a user feedback mechanism, and which then spawns your kind of final result off the back. Okay? Now, this sort of system still intrinsically is the same today, but what they've done is they've evolved um, the, uh, the mechanisms for the feedback um, and the, uh, the way in which they calculate their hits as well. That's kind of evolved as well over time. But Google has many servers clusters. They're all over the place. There's one, uh, and what happens is when you make a search result, uh, sorry, search, it goes off to the local server, comes back, and gives you the result um, for that particular server. And these, these servers crawl independently. They create an imprint of the web, and they have a different set of results for each particular server. Now, you might find that you'd make a search one minute, you get a result, and then you make a search again, you get a completely different result. It could be that a different IP, a different server gave you that response at that point in time. On top of this, your response is handled locally in different locations will de generate different results because localization filters get put in. So basically, if you're in Bombay and you search for pizzas, in fact, if I'm in Bandra, Bombay, which is where I live, by the way, uh, and you search for pizzas, you'll get pizzas in Bandra coming up because it knows that you're in Bandra and it knows that that's your locale based upon your IP. So it's able to change the results directly. Um, localized filters now goes then overlaid on your original result set to give your final result set. Now, there's something called personalized search as well. So that, what Google does is it looks at what you've looked at previously and where you've been previously uh, and what you sort of interact with. And it then starts layering on top of the results personalized filters, particularly for you. So if you, for example, um, have a high propensity to keep searching for your website, clicking on it, your website will actually start propagating up the results for you as a user because you keep searching for it and clicking on it. So you'll get a kind of a, 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 on your computer, it will say that you're number one for a particular thing. But on anyone else's computer, it won't say you're number one because they, they don't keep clicking on that on that particular site. So Google will kind of start manipulating results based upon your user interactions. Other things that Google's getting, getting the knack of is trying to understand you as a user. So uh, if you've got like a Gmail account or a G Plus account, you're kind of giving Google a lot of more information about who you are and what you do and everything like that. So it can start being really intelligent with the way it serves results. So for example, let's say you like the Beatles, okay? The Beatles, the band that is, and you search for the Eagles. The chances are you will get Eagles, the music, coming up because they're kind of semantically sort of linked between each other, okay? On a flip side, let's say you like ornithology and you search for the Eagles. Ornithology is the study of birds. You will get pictures of Eagles appearing, 
Okay? If you like American football and you search for the Eagles, you will get the American football team coming up. So Google's going to try and manipulate results based upon personalization for you as a user to give you the best possible set of results for the information. Because uh, it's, it's trying to get you kind of mapped out as such so it can give you the best possible results. So it makes it very interesting because every single computer has a very different profile, a very different sort of viewpoint of what the web looks like in, in, terms, of, in terms of Google. So from an SEO standpoint, there used to be this concept of rankings where people say, right, I rank number one. The reality is, is that might not be the case. It could be that you rank number one on your computer, but no one else it ranks number one for. Or you rank number one on an aggregate for maybe 20% of the web, but everyone else, you're not there. So it's sort of, the rank idea is kind of a thing of the past. So we've got to kind of, so that's just a bit of, a bit of, a bit of that side of Google. So Google's getting really, really, really smart. It's getting pretty clever, okay? Now your Google bot used to be pretty simple. It used to come to a page, it used to look for a link, it would crawl that link, go to the page, pick up the content and index that, do its word calculation and then stick that in the index and away we go, okay? What this meant is if you didn't have URLs, specific physical URLs in your, con uh, in your web pages, you were, the Google couldn't crawl and it couldn't get to content and couldn't index that content. So you had problems, things like Flash, JavaScript, uh, Ajax and these kind of like nice uh, experiential ways of programming um, which make all that kind of whizzy bang sort of websites, they made it very difficult for Google to crawl content because there was no physical URLs to particular pieces of content. Now this has changed somewhat. You've now got the dawn of something called a headless browser. How many of you use Chrome? Oh, wow, 60% is that? Okay, good, okay. Chrome, when you install Chrome, there is a tick box that says, do you want to feed information to Google? It's pre-ticked, and if you don't untick it, you're feeding information to Google. Now what Google does is it uses Chrome as a robot. You crawl the web for Google. You're, trans you're transferring information about how you utilize a page, how you scroll on a page, where you look on the page, where you click on that page. You're transmitting that information now. So no longer does Google need to crawl a URL. It can just use that browser and real people's sort of interactions to understand how, to how a website works and functions and things. So you've got this kind of concept of a headless browser. Google's been doing this for a rather long time now. So they've st since then, they've been able to start indexing Flash, uh, JavaScript and more, uh, more Ajax coin led sites, so they're able to get sort of better results. It's not perfect yet, but they're, 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 they're getting better at it, okay? Now, um, Google, a big part of Google is that they have a lot of updates, okay? Now, I, I mentioned before there was 500 updates a, uh, a year. Now, what this means is one minute you could be sat at number one, or what we feel is number one. The next minute, you're just down to page two and you've disappeared. And you're like, what, the, what on earth happened there? What, why have I disappeared? Now, the reality is what Google's trying to do is it's trying to give you the best possible results and it, it, um, for, that it can for a particular thing, okay? Now, what SEOs are always striving to do is break Google and break their system and work out ways in which they can get their results up to number one by spamming the system. Now, what Google does is it does an update which then targets these spammers and goes, well, that's, this, is, this is dirty. I'm going I'm to change this update which is going to get rid of these guys. What that means is when, when they do these updates, they might delete a tenth of the web, or they might change a kind of one, one knob up and another one down, so the web results kind of completely uh, bounce up and down. So it's not something to be like, oh my god, I wasn't number one and I'm now page two. It's something that's going to happen. It's just it, one of these things that just, that they, that it's nature of the beast, unfortunately, with, with, with SEO. But um, it's, it, it's a pain in my, in, in my backside as such, because every day I might be sat at number one, and then a the day later I'm at page two, the client picks up the phone and goes blah, 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 and my, my, it's like, well, I, I can't control what Google does as such, but it's sort of, uh, it's, it's part and parcel of, of, the, of the thing. But really what they're trying to do is they're trying to improve the results and make, it, uh, make them better for the users of the system. And, and so these are some of the big updates that happened um, over the last year. And there's two I want to highlight here, which I'm going to go into a bit more depth. There's one called Panda and there's one called Penguin. Okay, now, I don't know how many of you actually do SEO or know anything about SEO. Is there any? Okay, so there's a, there's a few people. All right, cool. So, SEO of old used to be links, 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 content, content, content. And you just spam the system and you keep doing this. And it, until such time, your re web results start coming up. Google took a, basically got a big gun out and shot this down last year. They, they Panda and Penguin uh, was, was the result of this. And I'll come to that in a bit, in a bit uh, down the line. Now, Something happened in 2010, which was quite interesting. Uh, an update happened. A company which had...
on, in order to do this, we make 15,000 tests a year, of which we'll implement around about 500 of them. So the, the, and they're constantly evolving their algorithm to make it that little bit better, that little bit more refined and, and, and better as we go. Now I'm going to need this back on. Oh, I'll switch it. Um, yeah, so they, they're constantly sort of... Uh, well, that's on. Well, just turn the laptop around, see if you can all see that. <laughs> so, yeah, these, these updates, uh, like I said, can be an uh, absolute nightmare for us as SEOs. Because one minute, one minute you're there, the next minute you drop out, and, and like I said, the client, client picks up the phone. But what, what, what I'm going to show you in a minute is sort of something that we should, uh, the way in which we approach it should be more philosophically in line with what, what Google say. Um, and it will, I'll show you how that works when, when, when this thing comes back on. So how many of you actually employ an SEO agency, if any? One person over there. All right, cool. Um, in fact, I know you, do I? No. Yeah, I do, don't I? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a... Uh, yeah, so basically, I want, uh, one thing I'd say about your SEO company is you've got to be very wary of what they do and how they do it. Now, SEO of a year ago used to be very simple. You could just spam the system and then things just started rising up. If you do that now, you'll put yourself in more trouble than you could possibly ever imagine. Google will simply black mark your site and you will just never appear. You'll never exist and that'll be that. So it's very important that when you do engage an SEO or you talk to an SEO that you have a good understanding of what he's doing and how he's doing it. Because if you, if you get it wrong in the first instance, then it could uh, have horrible, horrible implications further on down the, down the line. Um, is this projecting or not? Uh, you might want that side. Someone needs to press enter on the thing you've got. Sorry. Hey, right. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, Google updates. Okay, so I've been talking about these. So these, these, these two fellas I'm about to introduce are really, really important. Now, Google last year and this year uh, are cleaning up the web with a butcher's knife. They're literally hacking it apart. They are deleting content. They are deleting links. They are just removing everything. The first Panda update that I'm going to introduce you to deleted one-tenth of its index. So if you imagine how big Google's index is, it's trillions and trillions of pages, one-tenth of it just disappeared overnight. Okay? Now, this is the P team. There's Penguin and there's Panda. Okay? I don't know if any of you have ever heard of these two. Yeah? Okay, cool. Right, one, the first one, Penguin. This guy, he looks at low quality links. Now, one of the things that you want to do from a web, uh, when you're doing your SEO is that you build your content, you build links to it so people come to that content, and so hopefully it'll start propagating up. What SEOs of old were doing previously was they were just building links willy-nilly anywhere on the web. They were just, wherever I could put a link, I'll build it and put it in. And so I'll build millions of these, and eventually my web content would come up. Now, Google has now taken this guy out, and he's going through checking every single link from a quality, qualitative uh, point of view, and saying, well, this is a bad link, this is a good link, this is a bad link. And where they find there's lots and lots of bad links, they actually penalize the site and give you, uh, and, and basically give you a black mark, and your website will suddenly disappear. Um, other things that they're looking at is over-optimization. So when, when you optimize and build your links, you'd always build with context. So I'd say, right, I want to rank for pizzas in Bandra, so every time I build a link, I'll put pizzas in Bandra and link to my website over here. So I build, keep building, 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 say pizzas in Bandra, link here. And the more and more of those I do, the more and more I would come up the ranks for pizzas in Bandra. Now what they've done is they've realized, if you've got 100 links coming into your site, and they, all of those links say pizzas in Bandra and nothing else, they don't even mention your brand name or anything like that, that is completely contrived. It was no way that could, that could possibly organically happen. So as soon as they see that, they go, boom, black mark, and boom, you're out. So this guy is simply the, uh, the link police. He's going through and ascertaining whether or not your website's good or not, and then just starts deleting stuff as he goes. Okay? So what do we do to fix these things? So if any of you had websites which kind of you had good traffic, and all of a sudden it went boop, 
and it's now low traffic, this penguin would be one of the reasons why that might be. And in order to fix this, we have to kind of try and clean up the links that you might have and, and start removing them and things like that. But we won't get too much into this. But this other guy here, though, um, Panda, he's, he's all about content. So the other side of SEO is content. I keep writing content, writing, writing, writing. I keep pushing it out onto the web everywhere and everywhere. SEOs, again, would develop content on a huge scale, like millions and millions of pages. They'll just push them out onto the web. Absolute bogus garbage, which would then link back into their main website. Google will then find all this content and go, oh, great, this website's great because all these people are writing about it and linking to it. But the reality is it was all fake. There was nothing real about it. So what this guy does is he assesses whether or not content is good or not. And if he decides that your content is bad, it will simply just, again, cut it through and, and kill it. So it's very important just when you're starting out that you know that these two guys are out there because if you're doing bad things and naughty things, these two guys are going to come and get you. Um, so when you start building your sites, you've got to think, content. How good is my content? How well written is it? How useful is it? How, how engaging is it? And, so, and work from that premise so that this guy doesn't come and, come and get you. So you've got to fix this. You've got to write brilliant content. You've got to avoid content networks and all these other bits and pieces to avoid kind of get done by this guy. But um, the point being is SEO, uh, SEO is a very changed beast now. It's completely different from where it was a year ago. Because of these updates, they are changing the landscape in a, in a very big way. So how do we... Uh, negate this? How do we get around this kind of issue? Now, there's a concept of black and there's a concept of white. Now, black SEO, or black hat as they refer to it, is basically spamming the system. Links, 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 content, 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 keywords, 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 and uh, cloak, manipulate, deceive, and I forgot to say links, 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 links. Okay, so I keep just piling, piling, piling all this sort of stuff in there, which is bogus, it's not real, and trying to break the system. So this has not got a future. It's, it's SEOs that have done this, you, you're now going to get yourself into a lot of hot, hot water. Um, what you've got to do these days is you've actually got to think, what's Google trying to do? And I've got to complement that and try and uh, complement it to make sure that Google, Google achieves what it's trying to achieve. And if we can do that, then naturally our site should start propagating and coming up. Because what Google's trying to do is find the best content to answer the best user, uh, the user's intent. Therefore, if I'm kind of linking those dots for Google, Google will actually kind of start making it come up for me. So we've got to follow the mission. Organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. So we have to create information for one. We get it organized. We universally make it accessible. And then we make it useful. OK? Pretty simple. So information. What is information? I'm going to ask Google after all, because uh, Google is the source of all information, one might say. But facts provided or learned about something or someone. Or the cinnamon is. Intelligence, knowledge, notice, news, report, or data. Now, arguably, these are all forms of content. Okay? Now, how do we actually disseminate content? Now, you can disseminate content through text, through visuals, through sound, through code, through interactive learning, through lots of different ways. Okay? So if we take Google seriously, you've actually got to think about all these methods of information dissemination in order to get the best sort of user experience and get, get that content across. Now, we as an agency have a very firm belief. We actually believe that content should be the spinal cord of everything you do. Create good content, make it for the user and for your, for your target audience. They will naturally get there and find it and come to it because people will talk about it, people will share it, people will get there and it will start propagating. And from an SEO perspective, this should be the primary pillar that you build everything around. And make sure that your content is absolutely tip top. Um, so content is therefore key, but the forms of content can break down in lots of different ways. We can look at text, news, PR, how to guys, blah, 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 interactive, video, all these different things. So think about what it is you're trying to communicate with your user and think about what the best way of it communicating that is and then develop that and build that and deploy that. People will find it, people will talk about it, people will start interacting with it and it will naturally start to propagate up the results. Organization. So this is more to do with the first bit that we talked about, the old back rub piece. The back rub piece is pretty much similar to what it was uh, the day it was kind of written. And so there's some fundamentals that you need to think about when you build a website to make sure that the spider of Google can come in, it can crawl around, it can get to the content, take it away, take it back to Google HQ, index it, so that when someone searches, it can propagate up. If the spider can't get in, can't get to your content, can't read the content, doesn't understand the content, it's never going to index it, it's never going to rate it, it's never going to rank it. So this is fundamentally one of the most important things you need to think about. If you don't organize your content, then you've got, haven't got a hope in hell of ever kind of appearing anywhere. Okay? So um, how do we organize? We have the site itself, you have the content structure, you have the location 
parameters, and then signposting. Okay, so stru site structure is simply the way in which you structure your content within, within a kind of logical sort of folder system within your site. You need to have very clear text-based navigations which are easily navigatable, not only for the user, but this will also be very easily navigatable for the, for the spider. Um, logically organized parent-child hierarchical structures. So you have folders. So let's say um, you, so what's your company? Was it? Net Solutions. Net Solutions. What products do you have? Web, mobile, anything else? Software development, perfect. All right, so his primary business is web solutions. So my first folder, I'm gonna call it web solutions. His secondary, his parts which fit into that is software, mobile, and all these other services that fit within that folder. So his primary folder is web solutions. His secondary folders would be mobile, software development, and these other bits and pieces. And within those, there would be other sort of children of those particular things. You start creating a tree-like structure. So at the top end, you've got what your primary concern is, whatever you do, and then all of the subsections get built in, and sub-subsections and sub-subsections. So you start building that logical hierarchy of how your kind of product offering and service gets put out there, okay? So you then, once you've kind of created that, you create a URL path for navigational breadcrumbs which follow that structure. So you have your sort of uh, breadcrumb paths. So I'll have, in this instance, you'll see here, I've got my news section, and then within that I've got my 2008 section. It follows through. I have my URL path, my breadcrumb. They follow that logical structure. So when a user's navigating your site, the robot navigates the site, they understand what the structure and what the content looks like. If you don't structure your site like this, what you're effectively doing is you're just creating web pages, and they're not interlinked in any way. There's no association of these web pages. Whereas if you create a logical hierarchical structure, they all get associated with each other, where the top of the hierarchy gets the maximum sort of association with all these pages associated with it. And, and the more levels you build, the more kind of associations you get. There's something called microformats, which is a bit sort of advanced, I guess, but this, if you use microformats, you can mark up the contents. So the Google definitely knows what your website's about and how it, how it works, okay? So, site structuring. We need to have something called sitemaps, which are feeds that I can give to Google. I can give them all of my URL paths so it can easily crawl. Uh, you can have a HTML sitemap, which is basically a page of all the links that, uh, so if the user goes there, I don't know if you've ever seen that on a website, you'll see a sitemap link. You click on that, and you go there, you get aggregation of all the links of where you can possibly go to. These are very important pages. The reason being is the spider can come to that page and be linked off to any page of your site and access that page from, from this page, and it'll, it gets context when it does so, because each link will have the context of where it needs to go. So uh, in, in the example of the gentleman here, we had mobile and we had software development. On my, on my sitemap, I'll have a link for mobile, a link for software development, and a link for all the different bits and pieces that are dependent of that as well. Um, robots text file, it's a file that sits on the server. Um, and <clears throat> uh, it's a file that sits on the server and it commands what robots can and cannot uh, what they can and cannot do. So if you don't want Google to crawl things and index stuff, like for example, you've got uh, client information or, or secure data on your site and you don't want that getting indexed, you need to make sure that you block it using the robot's text file to say, hey Google, please crawl my site, but don't crawl this content, this content, this content, this content. Very important file to managing what actually gets indexed and things like that. Content duplication, very important thing this is incredibly, most websites that I audit have this problem and, and it's a huge problem in Google's term. If you imagine you're Google and someone comes, uh, someone comes to searches and when they search, the top 10 results are absolutely identical. So as a user, I click on the first one, go there, it's one thing, okay. I go to the next one, same thing, same thing. You would stop using Google as a user because it'd be rubbish, right? It's just all the same result. So Google, if it finds duplication in any way or form, be it on your site or someone else's website, it will automatically discount the, the duplicate. So the first one it finds, it'll go, okay, I found this piece of content, index. As soon as it finds a duplicate, it goes, oh, no, I'm not keeping that, not keeping that, yep. So, so you're not gonna get the credibility of that content. It's, it's other people's content. So, if you search for that content directly, it could be that you get that page indexed, but it would always be the, f the person who put it up first would get the top result. And you might index and be there like say, position 100 or 200 or something like that, but it would never be the, the same result coming up. You would never, yeah, the uniqueness would be much, much, much higher uh, uh, up there, yep. Um, So that's a big problem, right? So you're creating a complete duplication of each other. The two websites are, are conflicting, 
And when Google finds one website and the other website, it's like, well, what? Do I index this one or do I index this one? Or do I index a bit of that one and a bit of this one? And, it, and generally what it does is go, I'm not going to index any of them. I'm just going to go, well, it, or if it does, it won't serve up the results or anything like that. So what you need to do is you need to manage it very carefully. Now, in your, in your instance, why have you got two domains, if that's the case? For what reason would you have two domains to do this? Would you have a .co.uk or a .com or a... Country specific, fine. So if you do that, you need to do something called localization, where I say to Google, okay, this is a direct, so this, this tag here that I'm gonna talk about now, content uh, canicalization, there's something called a canonical tag, okay? And what a canonical tag does is, Increase the caffeine of my page if I have Twitter feeds coming onto a particular page on my website. So what, the frequency of it getting crawled? Absolutely. Or? So does my page get updated on this real-time basis as my Twitter feed gets updated? So will that increase the caffeine on my page effectively so, my website? So not necessarily, no. Um, it will, because Google's able to see the differentiation. I'll, I'll come back to your question in a second, so I'll get you side here. Um, but the, yeah, Google's able to different, uh, differentiate what type of content's there. So let's say if it's a Twitter box, it'll actually be marked up it will be a Twitter feed coming in and Facebook as well. It knows that those are those types of things. So it will index once. It won't necessarily keep coming back. If you keep changing your content with fresh content that is your content and unique to you, then that will enhance the amount of times that Google comes in and indexes. So, um, so those sort of plugins and plays, it's quite intelligent. It won't, it won't sort of keep indexing that sort of stuff and keep hitting off the back of that. It's more so that you want to get um, like... Uh, I don't know, if you're, right, if you're a news site, for example, and you keep pushing out news content, then that will automatically sort of get indexed and keep crawling. It will keep hitting your site very, very, uh, very frequently to, in order to get the new content that comes out. Um, to answer your question, canicalization, right? So this tag here, um, if I have two pages that are identical, and I need to have two pages that are identical for some reason, I need to tell Google that I have two pages that are identical. So I have something called a canonical tag, where I basically say, this page is a duplication of this page, so please ignore this one and accept that one over there. Any credibility that this page has, please pass it on to that page over there. So what Google will do is it'll index the, the page that you ask it to index, and it will ignore the other one, uh, so you won't get a kind of fragmentation, and it keeps that sort of uh, single point. In the, in the uh, terms of multinational content, so let's say I've got a page for the UK, I've got a page for the US and I've got a page for India and they're all identical but I've got different domains and everything like that. I would need to specify something called a local sort of uh, canonical which would be a href lang, uh, which sounds a bit, a bit mad but what that does is basically says this is English content, this is US content, this is Indian content and then you have a system called Webmaster Tools which I think is here somewhere, yeah, Webmaster Tools where I go into Webmaster Tools and I tell Google, this domain is for the UK only, this domain is for the US only, this domain is for India only. So if someone searches for your content, and I've linked all of them together, so I say, right, this is, so these are all canonically linked, they're all duplicates, but this is the UK, US, da, da, da. What will happen is all the value that these three pages accrue will merge into a single sort of value, and that value will then be uh, transferred to whichever location the user searches, depending on where that user is. So if it's in the UK, whatever value the three sites have, that will be transferred over here for that UK result. Whatever the three sites have, it will be transferred over to that result. So you can kind of manage the three uh, accordingly, so you will get the right domains showing up in the right places. I don't know if you've ever searched for Apple, well, how many of you have been outside the country and looked at India? But if you ever look at Apple in the UK, you get apple.com forward slash UK. You get, in India, you get apple.com forward slash IN. In US, you get apple.com. In Spain, you get slash ES. That is done through the localization. There's, there's, there's markup in the page to say this is Indian, this is uh, French, this is Spanish, and things like that. No, no, no. So you'll, you'll be heavily optimized for India, right? So you're, you're, if I'm ranking in India, that will not automatically translate to me being ranked in the UK. No. So, so what happens is the, the, it looks at the localization of the, of the page itself and like how many people in India are talking about that page, how many people are linking to that page in India, what the news is saying about that page in India. It's entirely localized for that page. So you have to have a completely separate en uh, sort of identity and entity sat in the, in, in the UK as well to get those, those rankings up. In it. It'll help, it'll help, but it's not the be all and end all. You still need to have that UK presence, that UK noise, that UK thing happening in the UK to make it sort of happen for you. Um, okay, error handling. 
Okay. Yeah, I just have a quick, quick question about this duplication. Like, I mean, we know that, uh, well, from our website, as soon as we write a content, we know another website copies it straight away. And okay. they, they copy it all the time. And when we say to them, oh, this is a duplication, they say, no, in Copyscape, it doesn't come up. So what they do is they change the words here and there, and the Copyscape doesn't uh, catches it. So the thing is, this is happening all the time. I mean, we spend a lot of money, a lot of effort writing that content, and straight away, it's copied. So um, in Google, you can make a uh, copyright claim. So if you are the owner of that content, someone has copyrighted that content, you can actually submit to Google and say, someone has, uh, has used my content, I am the owner of that content, and they will actually just remove that piece of content from their index. You can't get that guy to remove it from his website unless you actually call him up and say, oi, take it off your website. But you can ask Google to not index and not uh, use that content and if you are the official owner of that content. So, for example, um, we work with Star, Star TV. So we have many sites, 12, 15 sites, something like that. Um, and there are many bloggers who just crawl the site and as soon as we put content up, it automatically appears on a blog somewhere else and the video feeds goes directly onto that blog. And these blogs were ranking higher than us because what was happening is the blog was getting indexed by Google before Star got indexed. So the blog would get credibility, we wouldn't get credibility and so Star was losing out and things like that. So we basically just went to Google and filed a complaint uh, and, and Google literally within three days removed those blogs from the index. So all of those blogs just got chucked out, Star started appearing for all of that particular content. So it, it is possible. If you are the owner of that content and you can prove you're the owner of the content, then um, you, you, just, you can just file a complaint to Google. They'll remove it automatically. Yeah, so it's content spinning. That, yeah, so that's content spinning, and it's, it's part and parcel of the web. We can't, it's not something we can, you can't, comp it's just, at the end of the day, it's, it's what's going to happen. Like, you can't stop it unless you call them up and say, that's my content. Uh, and try and yeah, I mean, I mean we did call them up and they say, well, Copyscape doesn't uh, show it, so we're okay. No, but it, it, if you want, you can apply to Google, and if Google agree with you, they will remove that content. Okay. So that, that's, that, that's, Google do have that, that, uh, uh, that option for you. Okay, okay so we can... Ex How often do they update Penguin and Panda? Make mistakes? Yes, yeah, so they made loads of mistakes in the early days. They deleted Twitter. So Twitter was deleted like, uh, for like a good two weeks. And then, um, and then they had to roll it back and go, OK, sorry, sorry, Twitter. Uh, so yeah, they, they made mistakes, right? So, so that's why they, keep, they recalibrate. And they keep calibrating. And that's why websites keep going up and down and up and down. But now they've got like this auto function on where um, they add, they, it just keeps refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. Before, it used to be like, OK, they, they create a big list of sites they want to delete. They're then going to delete them. And you'd see that big shift. But now it's just they keep adding, 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 adding. Auto, it's an auto sort of uh, system in that sense. But yeah, hi, Ben. Uh, yeah. Is it just uh, uh, filing a reconsideration request for the content duplicacy by someone else, or uh, is there any other way we can uh, inform Google regarding that? There's a, there's a, um, I can't remember. Yeah, we'll take it offline. I'll talk to you about it. If you want to get your content protected, we'll take it offline. But there's, a, just a, there's a procedure. There's a URL in Google. It gives you the thing, and you can, you can uh, just write notes and give the two sites and everything like that. There's, a, there's actual a page within Google for doing it. Okay. okay. That's fine. So that's fine. So you, you've only actually got one URL live, right? So if I type in www.whatever.co.uk uh, and that forwards to .co.in automatically, then that's, I've only actually got one piece of content live. That's not an issue at all. That's fine. That's fine. As long as the redirect is done via a 301. That's bad. There's a two types of redirects. So make sure it's 301. I'll ask your developer that one. Um, error handling. Um, so if someone looks for a URL on your website and it no longer exists, a 404 error pops up. It's very important that you keep a usable functional page for the user. So if the user does come in on a broken link, it can actually find a page and you can click someone and navigate somewhere. You don't want to lose the user. You don't want to create a page saying 404, file not found, server error, and then that's it. And there's nothing else. It has to be like a, you want to create a usable experience. So make sure your server is configured to have one of these. OK, so content structure. Content must be indexable. And it must be sort of crawlable and indexable. An easy way of doing that is look at your web page, go Control A. Control C and Control V into Notepad and see if the content pastes into Notepad. If it does, you, you, you know it should be able to crawl that context. Okay? Um, content should be semantically marked up. So there's elements within a page which marks up that page. So you've got a title element, there's a description, there's a H1, H, alt tags, and bits and pieces. Right? We'll come to those in a bit. 
There's also opportunity to mark up content further to make it rich uh, in the results. So I don't know if you've ever seen these things, like star ratings, or um, what else can you get there? You can get prices within the results. You can, sorry? Reviews in the results. Huh? Pictures in the results, video in the results, all sorts of things are popping up in the results these days, lots of stuff. Now, all of that is coming from microformats, where basically there's schemas being developed where I can apply certain schemas to certain types of context so that I, that context directly feeds into the results. The grand plan of Google is that when you make a search for something, you don't actually need to go to a website. It's because Google will have the response for you within the web page of Google itself. And these things like microformats are improving that every day. So now you can just type for stuff like, for example, the exchange rate of X, X and Y, and that exchange rate appears. Or the flight, uh, the flight details of a particular flight, you look for that, that'll appear. These things are now directly feeding into the results, and they're being pulled from websites and pushed, pushed up. And it's microformats that are doing that. Um, so location settings, we talked about this a little bit. So mysite.com forward slash US, or us.mysite.com, different sites. If we're going to do this, we need to make sure we inform Webmaster Tools that this is the US content, this is my Indian content, so that there's no conflict of con content. If you don't do that, you'll have a duplication conflict, and then you'll have problems, and you, you don't want to ever have a duplication conflict. If you have local search, so I, I guess, how many of you have a local business? How many of you are local businesses that are only in Mumbai and things like that? Okay, this is absolutely the most important thing you should do tomorrow. Go to Google, register for local business, put in your business details, register the listing, and you will get local search results like this. And that will directly drive your business immediately. Because if you don't set up the local business, then you'll never show up in local business. But it's a very easy, quick thing to do. So uh, just look for, go to Google, search for Google, uh, Google Local for Businesses. And you get a page, and it says Get Started, click the button, follow the instructions. You don't see this at all? Or you used to see this? We used to see this, but now uh, people have changed it. They have to make some changes. OK. So now this thing is, does appear anymore. At all for any searches, or just, just for you in particular? So that, Okay, so check to see whether it's verified. Check to see whether, because a lot of them are being verified, and if you're not being verified, then you might have been thrown out. It's, it's still there. It's still there. So, so it's in the maps. So you'll get the local listings in the results. You'll get the, in the maps as well. If you look at Google Maps, your, local, your result will, be, will appear in the maps. Um, it'll on mobile. Your results will appear on a mobile. So it's just very important that you just register that one snippet. Register that. Oh, this is my company. I do X, Y, and Z. Um, this is my address. This is my opening hours. This is how you get hold of me. You just fill that in. Then you can start uh, appearing here. If you get your users or your customers to come back and actually review you on here, so you start getting Google reviews, then the more reviews you get, and the more sort of interactions your local listing gets, the higher up it will go within the local results as well. So you can start getting more feedback and things like that, then, then you'll start getting better, better results within local. Um, yeah? So you can't get locally listed because you, the thing about local, you have to have a physical location. You actually need to have a physical address. They will verify that address either via a phone call or a uh, postcard. They'll send you a postcard. You'll need to fill it in and, and send it back to verify. So it's a physical location you need to actually have. If you don't have a physical location, then you can't put a local result out. Um, but if you want to optimize yourself in the US, you'll need to configure yourself to say, I am US-centric. This is US content. Your content will need to be written in, in US English. You'll need to have dollars. You'll need to have interactions with companies and other sites within the US. You need to localize your entire SEO efforts. So you can't do your sort of Indian SEO on a US website and expect to show up in the US. You've got to make it actually localized to the US to get it actually uh, ranking and, and rated out there. No, no, you need separate content for US. So I went here, see here, like mywebsite.com forward slash US. So everything within that folder US 
is US-centric content. It could be a complete duplication of my site, and it's all US. But I tell Webmaster Tools that that is the US set of content, as opposed to the Indian. And you'd want to make it US-specific. You'd want to have more US-orientated imagery, and more a US phone number, a US sort of dollars, and things like that. Make your language US. So you try and make the whole page more uh, centric to that, and you'll get better results off the back of it because of it. Um, OK. So signposting. Signposting is pretty straightforward. If you want someone to get to your content, you need to signpost the way. And we signpost the way through links, effectively. Clearly link internally and externally with context, and signposts wish to be found for. So, for example, if you've ever searched for uh, click here, the number one result is Adobe. Does anyone know why? I'll tell you why. Okay. How many, how many websites have Flash? Uh, does anyone know what Flash is? Flash is like the whizzy bang sort of stuff that happens, right? Millions of websites have had Flash. How many of you have had, been told to install a Flash player? Yeah? So when, it's, when it says install Flash player, click here is the link. Okay? There are millions of websites out there that have a page uh, saying click here for Flash. And Adobe has a millions and millions and millions of links linking to it saying click here. Now, because they have so many links linking to it saying click here, they rank number one for click here because of all of those, all of those sites from Flash. So it's quite, quite random. So if you, if you, in, in SEO of old, if you kept building links for a particular context, then you would automatically start ranking for that particular thing. So with that said, you don't really want to link with things like read more because do you actually want to rank for read more? Not really, okay? But if you have more context, so I want to rank for pizza in Mandarin, then yes, that, that, that's much more contextually sound. That's something I would want to rank for, okay? This has caveats, though. Penguin, I talked about before, if you have a million links coming in that say pizza in Bandura, and all of your links just say pizza in Bandura, Penguin will go, well, that's not possible. How is it possible that everyone just links to you saying pizza in Bandura? That's, that's totally contrived, and they'll chuck you out, and, and that's it. So you need to have a kind of good balance of Real links and sort of, you've got to kind of make it a little bit, kind of uh, a good balance of that, but you do want to get some context in there. In, when it comes to your own internal website, all of your internal links should be contextually sound. So whenever you link from one page to another, it should always link with the context that you want that page to be found for. And make sure your entire site is always interlinked in a way where it's contextual. So we've got the site sort of architected, we've got content, we've, uh, we've marked it all up so it can be found. The next thing is we've got to make it useful. Now, Useful, how do we make things useful? Simple, we create stuff that's useful. We create content that's useful. Content is not only text, it's all types of content. So why limit yourself to one particular type? If the user finds you useful, so will Google. Google uses signals to look for how useful a page is and will then start ranking that page accordingly. Okay? Now, there's something called intent mapping. Now, Vivek was talking about mind readers. Google is a mind reader effectively. It reads your mind, it works out the kind of intent of what you want, and then it tries to display content in line with that intent. Okay, so uh, it's an intent engine, and always try and map that content to the intent. So um, you must create content that maps the user's intent. So if you want to rank for something, you've got to think, what is the intent of that particular word, and make sure your context, map, uh, your pay, uh, content rather, maps that intent. And if it maps that intent, you'll get good engagement, and the users will stick, and they'll engage, and you'll get good sort of response off the back of it. Okay? So understanding the user intent is really, really important. So for example, cameras. This keyword has many, many intents. Okay? Someone could be looking to buy a camera, research how a camera works, whether the camera in McDonald's is working or not, whether or not they're looking for images of cameras, they're looking for the definition of a camera. Could be a lot of different things, or camera brands, or, or camera lenses, for example. It could be a lot of different things they're actually thinking about when they type that word in. Now, will your web page actually answer all these intents? Probably not, because there's too many of them. There's, there's millions of intents that can come off the back of this one word. Now, this is the reason you get a bounce. Now, if someone comes to your web page and they don't find what they're looking for, they go, oh, that's not what I'm looking for, and they go straight out again. So this is the main reason you get something called a bounce rate. If your page doesn't answer the intent, then the user's going to bounce out. Okay? So it's a very simple measure if you think about it. If Google sends someone to a web page and that person comes back to Google and then clicks on the next guy, the, guy that he, the first guy that they clicked on, uh, he clicked on, sorry, um, did not answer the intent because it came back to Google and clicked on the next person. So it's a very simple measure for Google. If it keeps, keeps sending someone over here and they keep bouncing back to Google, then it's like, well, that's obviously not the best page for this particular query because every time I send someone there, it keeps coming back. Whereas every time I send someone over there, they stay over there and never come back to me. So 
If that's the case, Google will go, well, this is good content, and start propagating that. And any content that keeps bouncing will, will start dropping down because it's not the best content for a particular query. Okay? So bounce rate is a definite sign that Google can use to understand if your content is usable or not. And it's not that they have to go into your analytics and look at analytics to see whether you've got a bounce rate or not. It's just a case of, right, someone searches for cameras, they click the first results, go to the page, go, no, come back to Google, click the second result, stay there. That's a perfectly good signal to, to work out whether or not that page is any good. Um, so if, you're, if your page is not engaging and people are bouncing off and they're not staying on there, then it's not a very good page for that particular query. Um, so first impressions count. You've got two seconds probably less to engage that user, get them interacting with your page and in, into your page and results. Uh, yep, okay. So there's different searching patterns. Some people search in different ways, but in t I personally go click, no, back on the browser, click on the next one. So I might not, I, I, if you go right click, right click, right click, new window, new window, new window, I don't know, some people might do that, but there's enough measures to work out whether or not it's going backwards and forwards. And especially if you've got Chrome, you've got Chrome telling Google, well, this page is good, that page is not good. So you've got those other measures as, other measures as well. But it's a simple surrogate as to whether or not your content's good. If I keep sending 99 people to the page and 99 people bounce off that page for that particular keyword, you know that page is bad for that keyword, right? Because if, otherwise they would stay there and engage with it. Yep. But you're Um, yeah, and it's aggregated as well, right? So does everyone in here search in exactly the same way as, as yourself? Probably not, and you might be an outlier.